Greetings, Buy 100 team, and welcome back. We're hoping that this video finds you happy and healthy, even though we know that the semester is chugging along and you're doing a lot of work both in and out of the classroom. We're really, really grateful for your efforts and your attention and reminding you here just for a quick moment that if you need help, we're very happy to do that. Come stop by and talk to any of us. Visit office hours, drop us an email. Um, we really want to be here to support you. Um, and again, we're proud to bring you this uh, content. Today's video here is going to make good use and build upon some of the ones you've um, already interacted with before, particularly the reading week how to read a scientific manuscript. And that's always a daunting process. No matter what level of scientist you might be, I, I still find it very challenging to pick up a paper and, and really break it down thoroughly. We absolutely understand that and are hoping you're starting to feel just a little more comfortable doing this process. Today, and in this particular video, we're gonna kind of give you an overview of how to process those manuscripts at a very critical level, at a very analytical level. And we're going to break it down into two pieces. The first is scientific peer review. We want you to understand the process for how scientists evaluate a manuscript before it's published. What is all that business end of the story? And the second is, as a reader, how would you break it down and learn whether to um, trust a result or, or question it? Uh, learn how to think about the conclusions and what they might mean um, and uh, process your overall uh, acceptance of, of a particular work and your understanding of it. So writing those down into particular learning outcomes, here's what we hope. First, with regards to the peer review process, we want you to understand the submission and mechanics of how a manuscript goes from the lab bench to the journal. And secondly, we want you to be able to use all you've learned about reading a paper with regards to its very, very particular anatomy in order to then identify areas of potential concern. And I think this is a very important topic um, in a world of headlines. Um, if you just read a journal title, if you just read a headline without vetting the content, you might be misled a little bit, and we don't want that to happen. We want you to be thorough users and vetters of the scientific method before you will accept a result or a statement as true. Well, it's manuscript submission time, and if you're the scientists who just performed a lot of work to get here, well, it's time to celebrate. This is a big step, and it's cause for celebration. It really is, because did you know that it could take seven or more years sometimes to go from initial conceptualization and design of an experiment to then troubleshooting many, many results that go with it, to building a story that eventually gets published working with potential collaborators across continents, between different universities. Sometimes interdisciplinary work is involved, so you, you have to mesh chemists and biologists and, and physicists alike. That does take a lot of time, and it could take years to do. And that fact blew my mind when I learned it. So uh, if, you, if you hadn't had any appreciation for how long it might have taken a particular group to uh, go from uh, designing aims and questions and hypotheses, all the components of the methods that you've learned that uh, science is built upon, to then actually getting it into a journal, well, I'm, I'm right there with you. I hadn't thought about it much myself when I was in your shoes. And it was uh, a very eye-opening one when you think about it. So we're going to give you a general overview of this process and sort of the business that goes behind it. And as usual, this is a snapshot of it, and we're not going to be able to cover every single consideration. But we hope this gives you enough to go from as you leap into other classes afterwards um, and into your careers. We want to have a nice appreciation uh, for you uh, of where to at least kind of start thinking about all this. So. Here we go. First things first, 
you wrapped up that last experiment, you put down your pipette, and it was time to start to write this story. And uh, if you're doing it right, you might have been kind of writing it along as you were going from experiment to experiment. But you'll work with your fellow authors to choose which particular journal you want to submit to and follow the formatting guidelines of that particular journal. That sounds straightforward, except it can't necessarily be that all the time, right? And it turns out that every journal has slightly different rules, slightly different guidelines, and uh, each journal has a particular set of rubrics that they follow uh, for whether or not they want to consider publishing a particular paper in their journal. And so we're going to kind of go through some of those considerations with you because not all journals are the same and therefore not all articles from journal to journal are the same in their scope and in their findings. Impact factor then is actually a number that's assigned to each journal. There are various scales. Uh, the higher the number, the higher the impact factor. The more rigorous a scientific body is in order to have it um, published in a, that particular journal uh, that requires oftentimes really, really advanced methodologies and a very advanced uh, mechanistic understanding of a particular topic or moving a, a field in a big way in terms of its overall understanding of the biology or chemistry or whatever the topic might be. Maybe uh, we learned something very, very big about human beings in the process. Those are all very, very impactful findings. Potentially it was a, uh, a medical journal uh, like the New England Journal of Medicine and they did a big, big patient study um, with, with lots of controls and healthy and diseased people when we learn something about, let's say, diabetes. And, and that could be a very, very impactful finding. Um, in comparison, at the other end, potentially it was something that um, wasn't so uh, broadly human-based, but maybe we understood a, a solid mechanism. Um, that's great, great science. Uh, please don't um, think that impact factor is uh, a, a, an indication of the worth of, of the science. Uh, we don't think that's true. But at the lower end, that could mean uh, simpler methods and um, uh, a, a more just solid understanding of a, of, a, of a mechanism from start to finish and uh, building upon the scientific knowledge in that way is again just as important. So, so we do not want you to think that impact factor necessarily means importance. But scientists do have to choose uh, where they want to uh, submit their journal, and so impact factor is, is, a, is an important part of that process in where to shoot for um, in terms of the scope of their work. Whenever you look at a paper, you see the author lines and all the people involved, and so uh, the group has to make a decision about uh, the ordering of people and uh, how that works, and so journals have a, a um, very defined set of criterion for what constitutes authorship from uh, whether they uh, were involved with the design and um, creation of the experiments themselves to actually performing them at the lab bench and then subsequently analyzing results and writing and reviewing the work. So uh, you follow those journals guidelines to determine who gets to be on that um, all-important authorship line up at the top of the first page, and then might uh, uh, also give you guidance on who would come at the end of the paper. Sometimes you uh, flip to the back and you'll see an acknowledgments. Maybe uh, um, someone helped with a particular design of something, but it wasn't uh, significant enough to be in the primary authorship line, but you want to acknowledge someone for their contribution in some way. Uh, you have people on both ends there. I think it's important to remember that it's people doing the work, um, and when you look at the authors, you'll see one that's the corresponding author, and uh, that person can be emailed from anything from, could you please uh, even get me a, a PDF copy of your manuscript to, uh, wow, you, you guys made a really neat uh, mutant strain of bacteria, and I'd really like to have that in my lab. Um, if I paid for the shipping costs, would you be amenable to sending it to me? Uh, corresponding author can be contacted for any of those things. 
and you also see their affiliations, which gives you a really good idea of where the work was done, and that could be an important consideration for you, uh, young scientists, if you're thinking about going into graduate school or trying to get work in a particular area of, of the state or different country. Knowing who does what and where is a key thing, and as you get involved in science, you'll see that it's actually a pretty small world. Every journal has very strict word and or page limits, and so that is a very important consideration, um, and it will become even more so uh, later on in this video. As I tell you, sometimes a paper is submitted and then returned to the authors, and, and the decision is, please submit it somewhere else, and then you pick a different journal that has a completely different set of word and page limits, and so you have to reformat and rethink your story, and um, uh, strict adherence to these word and page limits is a key for the publication of your paper. And of course, figures and supplemental materials. Journals have very established criterion for what data should look like, um, and we had a great data visualization uh, module already. Uh, but sometimes you'll see a, a particular figure have multiple sub-panels, um, and sometimes you'll see papers have a set of supplemental materials as well that um, add on to the, the paper's findings, but that aren't included in the primary set of pages, and so it's usually a separate file linked at the end. So after choosing which would go where, which figures and tables and other types of data would go into the primary body of the work, and which would potentially go as uh, supportive documents in a supplemental materials, which actually also includes sometimes a more detailed description of a method. Now it's time to put that all together and, and get it submitted, and usually journals have an online submission process for that. Once you press submit, you breathe a sigh of relief, you have some fun with your lab. Maybe you ring a victory bell in the lab. Uh, some, some actually have that. And then you worry and you start to get very nervous with each passing day because it's now time to wait. And no one likes waiting. Not for anything. Not for a bus. Not for a parking spot at Sac State. Not for anything. I don't like to wait. I'm very impatient. But now we'd have to do that, and the fate of your manuscript rests on the following uh, couple of procedures. Your journal, once it goes through the online submission queue, is assigned to an editor that is a scientist in your field that knows your work and the scope of the methods and findings you might have there. And their job is to uh, vet that um, and and make a, an important decision about whether they think that your whether or not your submission meets the standards and criterion is aligned with the impact factor of their particular journal. And this was surprising to me too. I had no idea about this business. Um, I also didn't know that the editors um, and the peer reviewers that we're going to talk about in a moment are all doing this on a volunteer basis. And so this is not actually a paid position at a journal, which I thought it might be. Um, this is typically done by scientists um, who are at universities or companies, and uh, they're just uh, very, very vested in, in having uh, a high quality science published to contribute to the uh, body of knowledge in their, in their particular field. So we wait for what's called editorial review. This process takes time and hopefully not too much time. But here's what's under consideration. Whether or not the work meets the scope and purpose of the journal, and an evaluation of the overall scientific merit uh, of the particular study. The, the novelty of the methods, how new they are, um, how important these findings might be, and the editor has a very, very important decision to make. They can let you know that they think, yes, this does indeed uh, accomplish those two things, and so therefore I will send along your manuscript for peer review, which will take more time, or I will outright reject that manuscript and say, I'm so sorry, um, this, this does not accomplish those two things. And 
hopefully a good editor will provide you some feedback and some guidance um, if they do reject it to help improve your study. I really believe that the purpose of all of this uh, submission and review is to make the science better. And I hope that that's the approach by most, although it's not um, always. Some people just like to be critics. Um, I always kind of think about that uh, super negative Yelp reviewer um, who is talking about going to dinner with their BF and they go on and on about all that and I, you know, I don't really care about that. I just, I just want to see a picture of the food and, uh, and, and just kind of move on from there. I'll, I'll decide myself. Um, <laughs> you don't need to be too negative there. Um, but sometimes scientists are very, very negative uh, during this process and that could be super deflating. So hopefully a good editor and then subsequent peer reviewer, um, even though their job is to find um, and vet uh, the scientific body of work, um, if they do suggest um, improvements, it's, it's for the sake of improving it and not just to cut it down. So the clock is ticking. We hope that this editor uh, reviews and makes a decision in a very speedy and timely manner. Um, but sometimes that could take a little while. Um, sometimes it could take a month or two, hopefully less than either of those options. Because the fate of the manuscript then takes more time. So if the editor decides to reject the study, um, says, I'm so sorry, the um, journal thought your work was great, but uh, not quite significant for what we try to do here, um, now we have to return to step one. We have to go all the way back and choose a new journal and now maybe actually have to rewrite or reformat um, those findings um, or maybe even do some more experiments. Perhaps perhaps the editor said, hey, if you do these things, you could resubmit to our journal. So you might have to just add a few more experiments and then resubmit to that journal. Or you might say, eh, I don't want to do that. Uh, maybe we'll just go to a different impact factor journal. Um, if the editor said, congratulations, I think this does uh, meet the criterion, then uh, we'll go on to step three of the process, which is our next slide here. Oh, good. I'm so glad to see that I have to wait again. Yeah, so the next step is waiting once more for what's called peer review. And so the editor is going to assign your journal, your manuscript article, to folks in your field. And again, this is a volunteer service in most places. To either two or three scientists in the field depends on the journal. Uh, sometimes there's two reviewers and sometimes there's, there's three. And believe it or not, this particular part is anonymous. So you, when you submitted the article, knew the name of the editor, but you don't know the names of the uh, researchers performing the peer review. They do know your name and all the authors though. So there is a bit of a uh, conflict of interest there. And what I like is this new movement in science to have everything be um, uh, not anonymous but uh, open. And so uh, there's lots of journals now requiring reviewers to put their name on it and even have that name published on the article as a reviewer. And I think that's a great idea. Um, I think more transparency and more understanding of who's who um, will allow to a more um, kind and thorough, actually, uh, scientific review process, just as when you have to put your name on your reviews online for something. So after the peer review takes place, which again could take a couple of months or more, um, you have the following uh, th uh, three decisions uh, that might uh, come to your inbox as you are constantly checking your inbox every single day, wondering about the fate of your work. Uh, the first is uh, the most unfortunate type, um, and that's outright rejection. Potentially the peer reviewers thought, while it did meet the scope of the journal, there were flaws in either the methods or the study design or both. Potentially they, they thought you needed to do um, a significant amount of um, uh, revisions and further experiments that um, they thought were just beyond the scope of, of this particular um, submission round, and so they rejected outright. If that's the case, you're going to have to return to step one and again choose the journal. You might 
uh, hopefully get some very helpful feedback from those reviewers and decide let's let's do those experiments and and submit again to this journal maybe that takes you another year or even two years to do um, or longer or or shorter but it could take a long time um, or you can decide to submit to a different journal and that might re again require some rewriting and revision this is the second time that could happen uh, another potential outcome of peer review is um, one for uh, medium level of celebration, uh, acceptance. Um, the, the peer reviewers thought, yes, this is, uh, um, it meets everything we want, um, except we require you to do some revisions. Um, we don't think they're um, too much that you would uh, have to uh, potentially be outright rejected, but um, if you do these sets of experiments, or um, um, which are limited, um, and if you address some of our questions, maybe the writing wasn't unclear, or you didn't analyze this properly, or we, we, we think you could do that in a reasonable time frame. Um, and so we want you to complete these reviews, that respond to our comments, um, and then uh, return to step two. In other words, uh, perform those works, do those revisions, send it back to the editor so they can send it back for another round of peer review before final acceptance. And so that takes another uh, uh, significant round of time depending on how long uh, you have to perform experiments to meet those criterion and then have it go through the review process all over again. The third um, and the most happy outcome, but a rare one, is uh, outright acceptance. And they, they said, your work needs um, just maybe a minor tweak um, in wording, but uh, you know, otherwise everything is done appropriately, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and publish it as is. That's obviously the most happiest of the trio and cause for celebration, and it's time to party like it's 1999. I know you don't know my references, but if you do know this one, well, keep calm. And party like it's 1999, Prince style.